Now, what happens next is he gives a long list of qualifications or characteristics of these leaders, these overseers. And he begins with one, he says this in verse 2, an overseer must be above reproach. An overseer must be above reproach. You, you could put the description this way, an unstainable character. An unstainable character. It doesn't mean that this particular person is perfect. He's not. No leader ever will be. And accusations will come against him. But what it essentially means is it's not going to stick. That people will say, well, did you see what Pastor Bruce did last week? Yes, I saw what Pastor Bruce did last week. Well, did you, did you know why he did? No, no. And they start. And so things are going to be said about a leader, but would they be true? See, I think that what he's saying here about being above reproach is the umbrella under which all of the following characteristics fit. He's saying, I want you to have a character such that it is in alignment with God's Word and God's reputation and God's character such that when people make accusations against you, it, it isn't true. It doesn't stick. We're going through kind of a difficult situation in our church right now. There are a couple of families who are unhappy with me. They're unhappy with me because of certain theological things that they are very fearful of for our church. I've tried to reassure them that I and my associate pastor, we're aware of these things and we are protecting the church. And they say, well, Pastor Bruce, you aren't saying enough. You aren't warning enough. You have to do more. And so we're kind of engaged in this conversation. And what I really love about this is that it isn't just about me. The other elders that we have in our church have got involved in this discussion. And they said, all right, what do the scriptures say? Pastor Bruce, have you done things in an honorable way? Have you treated these people with respect? They said, brothers, you need to come alongside of me and help me in this one. Maybe I haven't done things in the right way. Maybe there are things where I need to confess because I want to have a character that is above reproach as, as much as possible as God continues His work in me. So if you can imagine this quality of being above reproach as the umbrella under which all of what you're about to see begins to fall into place. So above reproach. The next one he mentions after that is still in verse 2 when he says the husband of one wife. Now, in the United States, this has been a huge discussion. What does this mean? And primarily where the discussion falls is, can an elder, can an overseer ever have been divorced? Some have taken the argument to mean, can this person have be a widow, or a widower, I guess it would be, for the male person? Can this person who have had a wife who has died, can he be? And if he's remarried, can he possibly be an overseer? And the different debates on there. And it's been an interesting discussion and a very difficult one. And, and different theologians differ on exactly what this means. One of the things that has been the most helpful to me in trying to find an answer to this question of, Paul, what do you mean the husband of one wife? Obviously, you're not going to allow polygamy. You can't have more than one wife. That's very clear. But what about the man whose wife has died and he has remarried? Are you talking about him? Well, no, then you go to, see, this is where context is so important. Are there other places in the Bible that speak to the issue of when a wife dies? Is a husband free to remarry? Absolutely. Well, if a husband's wife dies and he remarries and the Bible says that that is perfectly fine, why would that limit his ability and opportunity to lead? I don't think that it does. I think that would be fine. Where it gets real tricky is on the issue of divorce. A number of years ago, we had um, our, we have a church chairman, and then we have a group of elders. And the church chairman would sit in on our elder meetings. We wanted him to be informed about what was going on. And he had been divorced before he became a Christian. This was probably 30, 35 years ago. He had remarried, and the woman that he had married, both he and she had become Christians. So the divorce had happened while he was a non-believer. And we began this discussion of, well, if the Bible says the husband of one wife and you were divorced, could he be an elder? And we debated back and forth, and sometimes our argument was severe. I remember one meeting where I left in tears because of the discussion. 
And I think what we need to remember to help us understand this particular issue is this. For Paul, the issue is always about the gospel. You say, Pastor Bruce, that's not even in this verse. What do you mean? That's context. If for Paul, the issue is always about the gospel, what would that mean in this particular character quality for a husband in the context of divorce? So let's suppose that a person is recently divorced and recently remarried. And you all are new visitors to our church. And you say, oh, I'd like to meet the leaders of your church. And you're, you're a new Christian and you're kind of struggling in your faith and you're trying to kind of find your way. And so I introduce you to our, one of our elders and this happens to be the man who has just recently been remarried. And you're new in your faith and you're kind of struggling with your faith and you say, so it's okay what has happened to him? I know his reputation. I know why he divorced his wife. I know what led to him being remarried. In fact, the woman that he is now married to is the reason he got his divorce and he is one of your key leaders. What would that do to the work of the gospel in you if you saw that? It would be a negative influence on you. Paul says, the husband of one wife, let's look at that in the context of the gospel itself. So when I look at this, so let's go back to the example of the man in my church. He was not a believer when he got divorced. It had happened 30 years ago. He and his wife had become believers shortly after that time. And for years and years and years, they had served the Lord faithfully. His integrity was great. Uh, his, his work in the church was fantastic. His heart for the gospel was unbelievable. There was nothing in him that you would say, oh, so that's what he's really like. Now, in your particular churches, you're going to have to wrestle with this, this issue yourself. So I'm only going to say it in the context of our church. I would welcome this man to be an elder in our church. I think that his character, again, above reproach is the umbrella. Underneath that, the divorce occurred in the past of his life. And so I would say, let's go ahead, welcome him on because his character and his integrity is intact. Now, that's the toughest one. Let's continue on with this list of character qualities. Above reproach, the husband of one wife, and next, sober-minded, and let's take these next three together. Sober-minded, self-controlled, and respectable. A sober-minded person means he can keep his head in all situations. In other words, he's not easily provoked. You can't, he's not a, a, a person who gets angry quickly but he has a seriousness about him. Self-controlled fits very well. He has control of his mind. There are times as elders in our church where our discussions get a little bit heated, a little bit animated, and there are times when you have to say, Bruce, now just calm down. <laughs> we're having a good discussion. It's good that we're discussing these things, but just back off a little bit. Respectable means that there is an inner self-control governing what's on the outward display. That you conduct yourself with dignity you're not trying to put on a hypocritical face. You're simply trying to say, you know what? My heart is going to govern the way that I live. Let's continue on with the list. Hospitable. You enjoy having people in your home. It literally means a lover of strangers. As what often happened in the first century, people would be traveling from city to city and they didn't have holiday inns and Ramada inns and fancy hotels in which to say, stay. So they would find out that there would be believers in this town and they would say, oh, we're passing through. We're going to be in your city for the next couple of days. And they say, oh, come over to my house. Would love to have you in my house. He says, if you're going to be an overseer in the church, I want you to have that heart for strangers that says you're welcome here anytime in any place. Next one, he says, hospitable. And then he says, able to teach. It doesn't mean that he has to be teaching all of the time. And it certainly doesn't mean that he has to preach but that wherever God gives him opportunity and gives him ability, he shares what he knows about God's truth with those that God puts him in contact with. If the qualification was that every elder had to be able to preach, we would have very few elders. I think that what Paul is saying, he says, you know, as God is teaching you and as others are teaching you, you are the kind of people who are willing and able and have the ability to teach others. The next one, he says this, not a drunkard. Again, this is all about the above reproach. This is all about the gospel. 
if you have a leader in your church who is an alcoholic and the people in your church and in your community know him to be so, what will that say about the gospel message? Paul says he can't be addicted to wine. Next one, not violent, but gentle, not quarrelsome, and not a lover of money. Again, these are all things that can be observed by people both in your church and in your community. Paul says, I don't want you to be known as a person who is beating up on people, but a gentle spirit. Not a combative spirit, but one that loves people. Not quarrelsome, not willing to get into arguments. Do you know people like that, that just love to get into a great argument? When I, when I hear something a bit controversial, my ear kind of perks up a little bit and I go, oh, I would love to be a part of that conversation. But because of my role, I say, you know what, Bruce, you have to conduct yourself in a way that is not going to let this get out of control. I love the engagement. I love the debate. But I understand that I must not be known as a person who is a quarrelsome or that kind of person. And how about lover of money? Does that mean that an elder can't have money? Doesn't mean that at all. But see, when you serve the Lord, if your passion and your desire is to get ahead in financial means, he said that's going to affect your ability to serve. And everybody knows people who are in love with money. I do. You watch it in their lifestyle. You watch it in the way that they, they flaunt what they have. Oh, I'll take care of that. You know, I've, and he pulls out a large, you know, certain amount of bill. I'll take care of that. See, this is all part of the being above reproach. In the first century, Christianity was under an examination lens. People were looking at it very closely to say, what are these Christians like? What do they believe? If we're going to find out what they believe, we're going to find out how they live and how they act. Remember our phrase, belief drives behavior. So when people watch how you live and how you behave, they're going to say, now I know what they must believe. So these character qualities that he's talking about become observable in the life of the church. They become observable in the community and the people in which they serve. Look at the, look at the transition he makes in verse 4. He looks instead of just the qualities that people would observe out there to, into his home. Verse 4 says, He must manage his own household well with all dignity, keeping his children submissive. Why? For if someone does not know how to manage his own household, how will he care for God's church? We have four children, ranging in ages from 6 to 14 to 12 and 8. If I am known as a pastor or as a leader for a house that is totally out of control, suppose that I invite you to over to my house. And the house is a mess. It is a disaster. Our children are fighting with each other and they're squabbling with each other and they're pulling each other's hair and they're breaking each other's toys. And you come into my house and you say, this is a leader in your church? How can you trust me to be a teacher of God's Word if my home is chaotic and out of control? Now, I also have to explain this. My children are not perfect and I am not the perfect dad. There are times when I get tired and I get grumpy and I'm not a very good father. But I also understand the responsibility that I have that ultimately I am, I am to provide an oversight for my children. And let's be honest, Trudy is the one who is at home far more than I am. She has an opportunity to be with our children more hours in the day than I am. Does this mean that Trudy should not have a role in our home? Not at all. But I understand that I am responsible for our household, for our home, for our children, even if Trudy does a lot of the nurturing, a lot of the caring. I understand that. I stand accountable before God. And if my home is chaotic, that becomes a detriment to the gospel message. Now, verse 6, another quality. He says this, He must not be a recent convert, or he may become puffed up with conceit and fall into the condemnation of the devil. Now, in every church, there are people who come to Christ in a very dramatic way. And you say, oh, their testimony is fantastic. And, 
if we could just disciple him a little bit, I bet he would make a fantastic leader. Maybe it's a, a person involved in the business world or the sports world or the music world and he comes to Christ and his faith is just alive and dynamic and he's excited and he wants to serve and he says, I would do anything to serve God in this church. Can I help out in some way? And you say, whoa, I bet he's a leader. We should make him an elder. Um, no. What happens when someone is new in their faith is they don't understand enough of the Christian life and of the nature of the church and the comprehensive nature of the gospel to understand how that works in terms of being a leader. We've had situations where someone has come to Christ and we didn't place them in a major leadership position, but we gave them a chance to offer a testimony. So in the course of a sermon I would say, and now I'd like to introduce to you Mr. Smith and he's going to come and tell you what God has done. I think that's a great thing, but that is a far different thing from being a leader. In fact, what we do when someone experiences a life change, we try to involve them in some kind of service in the church. I think of this man who was in our church, he and his wife, for a few years and then they moved somewhere else, but his name was Corey. I wish that you could meet him. I wish I had a picture of him, but they have moved from our church probably six or seven years ago. If you were to meet Corey, you would say, is he a Christian? He had this really gruff voice, like he had been a smoker for many years. So when he talked, he kind of had this gravelly kind of voice. And he had long hair that he had pulled into a ponytail. And you go, if you were to walk into our church and see him, you would say, oh, he must just be a visitor. I mean, what is, just looking at him, you would say, he can't possibly be a Christian. But he was. And in those few years when he and his wife were part of our church, they became just locked in in their love and desire to serve the Lord and just amazing faith. We have a Saturday morning prayer group that gets together and he would come to this Saturday morning prayer and I tell you what, to listen to this man's prayer made my whole day. When he talked to God, it was like God had pulled up a chair right in front of him. Their conversation was that close and that intimate. I meant, man, that is fantastic. So you know what we did? He was looking to serve. We made him an usher in our church. Now in our church, when people come, if you have this in your church, you help them find a seat or you give them a worship folder and you say, welcome to our church. And they would, he did a fantastic job. We did not make him an elder or an overseer. He wasn't ready for that yet. But we watched him as he served in this role and we said, he's doing a great job at the level that he's at. See, that becomes our task as pastors and leaders of church, to analyze the depth and maturity of a particular person and say, this is where he would fit right now. Then if he demonstrates his ability here, we bring him to this level and then to this level. And it's a wonderful process and I think a very great process. Let's conclude it with verse 7. Moreover, he must be well thought of by outsiders so that he may not fall into disgrace, into a snare of the devil. See, remember Paul is always about the gospel. I can't say that enough. For Paul, the gospel is everything. Jesus Christ's death, Jesus Christ's resurrection, what that means in the transformation of a person's life, it is everything. Paul says it is not enough for the men who serve as overseers in your church to have a good reputation only there, but outside your church, in your communities, when people talk about this particular person, there shouldn't be anything that would scar or have a damaged reputation in his life, not perfection, but something in an ongoing way that is a damaged reputation. Let me give you another example. We have a man in our church who is an outstanding leader. He is very strong. He is very intelligent. He is very capable. When you put him in charge of a project, it gets done. It gets done extremely well. The problem is the work that he does puts him in contact with a lot of variety of people and he does not have a great reputation with them all of the time. Because I used to, to farm and before I became a pastor, I came in contact with a variety of people and when his name would come up, they have said, is he in your church? Well, he did this or he did that or I remember when he did this. You know what? That person, because of some things that are known about him in the community, I would say, brother, 
you love the Lord, you serve well, you lead projects well, I don't think that it's the right place for you to be an overseer in our church at this time. I think that's kind of hard for him because he aspires to be a leader. He, he desires to be this, and Paul said that that's a great thing. But I would say, brother, when you've fixed your reputation, when you have lived for a number of years so that people no longer have these things against you, you would be very welcome on our leadership team. This whole picture, if you put it together, again, falls under the umbrella of above reproach. We want godly leaders, not perfect leaders. We want mature leaders who are not just recent converts, but who have been involved and growing and learning and have a hunger and desire to be the kind of godly men that God can use to advance the gospel of Jesus Christ through His church. Have you benefited from this teaching ministry? Have you found TVS videos helpful and relevant? Please consider supporting TVS with your prayers and financial gifts. For more information, please visit www.tvseminary.com. Let me talk to all of you men here and out there who are listening to these words. If you're a follower of Jesus Christ, is there something inside of you that says, you know, I'm not sure if I have what it takes to be that kind of leader, but there's something inside of me that says, maybe, maybe. Maybe you're young, maybe you're 18, 20 years old, 25 years old, and, and, and you're hungering and thirsting for the righteousness of God and you're growing and you're saying, Pastor Bruce, what should I do? I would say, get involved in your church. Serve in any capacity that you can so that when people look at you, they say, oh, look at his life, look at his character, look at his integrity. Maybe there are some men here who are listening to my voice who say, you know what, I'm 50 or I'm 60 or I'm 70 years old and they don't want to listen to me anymore. I'm too old. But my work isn't done yet. Brothers, if, if God is putting a burden on your heart to serve in leadership, let them observe your character in your service. Let them see your passion for the gospel and the word of God and the integrity of the church. And let your character, let, let people see your character in such a way that they say, I think that we should consider him for leadership. Whether you're young, whether you're old, whether you're in the middle, this is always about the gospel of Jesus Christ. And we are looking for men of integrity, men of character, men who love the Lord, and men who love his word to serve in that way. And I just wonder, is that you? Do you aspire to that? Could you be that kind of person? That would be my prayer that that's the work that God would do in you. Now he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will also supply and increase your store of seed and will enlarge the harvest of your righteousness. You will be enriched in every way so that you can be generous on every occasion. And through us, your generosity will result in thanksgiving to God. 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 10, 11. How to give to TVS Ministry. You may give online at efta.org slash give now. In the description place, write Russia Distance Learning account number 24109-0150 or make checks out to EFCA. Write on the check memo line, Russian Distance Learning, account number 24109-0150. Mail to EFCA Donor Services, 901 East 78th Street, Minneapolis, Minnesota, 55420-1300. Or send your gift through PayPal for tvs.gif 